Well, welcome to Impact Bible Study. We're on Lesson 23, Revelation 19. And aren't you so glad that we can study God's Word together today? You know, we uh, even though technical difficulties, even though we're not all together in one room, we can still study God's Word together today. You know, God is very pleased and glorified when we study His Word. When we come with hearts that really want to seek Him and His Word, we want to know Him better, we desire to understand and apply and obey His Word, God is really pleased by that. You know, this morning, as I was getting ready and thinking about being here basically in my office by myself, no offense Donna, but uh, by myself teaching, um, I was thinking about the faithfulness of God and how He has blessed this group of women Impact Bible Study. It started back in 2005 with just a small group of women, and as we have grown, God has provided everything we needed, including today, what we needed today to study his word. He's provided places and resources and, and leaders. Um, after we met here in my home for a few years, we moved around to different homes and, and different basements and different churches. I'm not going to name them all because I'll forget someone, but... Um, particularly thankful to Hosanna Lutheran, who let us meet there for years, and for Kathy Grocky, who spent countless hours setting all those tables and chairs up and moving them around and taking them down so we could meet there. And we met in different people's homes, and we had small groups in dining rooms and living rooms and dens and kitchens and hallways and even bedrooms. <laughs> we would meet for small group time. And Many women over the years have given in many ways. They've hosted and served and cleaned and set up and sacrificed their time and, and a lot of money so that impact could continue. This is all part of God's grace and faithfulness to us. I remember it was such a big step when we bought those long tables to sit at. Some of you remember that, right? When we, we, uh, we met in, at Wanda D's house in her basement, and we had tables to sit at for the first time, and we could spread our things out, and, and how God provided that. Uh, we did ask the women to donate, hey, if you want to sit at a table, you got to pay for the table, and then we said, you have to bring your own chair. If you want to sit, bring a chair. Um, those are some of the uh, good memories about that. And then we've been so thankful that uh, Riverside has allowed us these last four studies that we've had to meet at, at Riverside uh, Community Church. Um, right before we came to, live, to Riverside, the day group met at Mecca um, on M Musical Education Centers of America, owned by uh, Linda and Bob Tischler. And I just have to thank them. I was thinking about them this morning, how that every weekend they would take their store completely apart and set up those long tables for us to come in and meet. They they would close their store, we would have Bible study, and then we could get it all set up in time for their store to reopen. And for years and years and years, they allowed us to meet there. And I found this, and some of you are going to um, find this very familiar. We put this every Monday morning on the uh, front door of Mecca to welcome the women to Impact Bible Study. And uh, that was what you saw when you came. What a great reminder, and again, how thankful we are for how God continues to provide in so many ways. And Lord willing, we will continue to meet to study his word. Um, don't know when the Lord will return. Uh, no one knows, but this could be the day that the father turns to the son and says, go get my kids. Go get my kids. I get choked up every time I say that, the thought of um, going home. Uh, at any point with the rapture to go get the kids. Well, talking about the rapture, that's part of the second coming. And you know that the second coming is in two parts, I believe. Um, the, the rapture and then the uh, at the end of the tribulation when, when Christ comes as king. And there are actually 1,845 biblical references to the second coming of Jesus. 1,000. 845. So do you think this might be an important event, the second coming? Do you think God might want us to know about this event, some things about this event, since there are so many verses in his word about it? Actually, what do you think about the second coming? What do you think? What comes to your mind? Or do you even think 
about the second coming. If, if you're like most of us, we go long periods of time and don't even think about the fact that Christ could return. I think in these days, as we've studied Revelation and with what's going on in our world right now, we've thought about it a little more often, right? That he could return at any time. What do you expect? Of course, as believers, we're looking for the rapture. That's what we're expecting. Uh, but for those who are non-believers, they may not be expecting at all that second coming after the tribulation. And when it comes, it may not be what they expect. And Jesus may not be what they expect. And that's what we're going to study today. What will that second part of the second coming be like at the end of the tribulation. What will Jesus be like? Will he be what people expect? And that could be the problem. He's not going to be perhaps what people expect. Well, let's just stop and pray as we get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are here with each one of us and that you will guide us into your truth and you will give us wisdom and understanding and help us to rejoice in your truth and know it and apply it and believe it and and i pray that these truths we're going to study today lord that uh, we will be motivated to tell others about the fact that jesus is returning and he is coming as judge not the savior of the world but as judge and lord help us to have opportunities to share the gospel and to um, take those opportunities and to share the gospel clearly, open people's hearts. But as we study today, Lord, we look forward to what you have for us in your word. And we're depending on you and looking to you. We love you, exalt and praise you. And we do all this in the strong, precious name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, speaking of a precious, let's have our popular quiz. And today's quiz is five questions plus a bonus question. So five questions and a bonus. And of course, this is over Revelation 18, the uh, material that we studied last week. So number one, John sees an, uh, an angel that has great authority. And what word does this angel use twice to describe the city of Babylon? He uses the same word twice to describe the city of Babylon. What is that word? Number two, a voice from heaven gave a command to the believers that were in Babylon. What was that command that a voice from heaven gave to the believers who were living in Babylon? And of course, this is in the future, at the end of the tribulation. What were the believers told to do? Number three, we studied three specific sins of Babylon. And these are the sins that we, if we look and examine our own lives, we commit these same sins sometimes. The first one was to be prideful and self-absorbed. The second one was to be materialistic and just want more stuff and more things. <clears throat> what was the third sin? of Babylon that the great harlot was guilty of that we struggle with also. Number four is true or false. True or false, the destruction of Babylon will be progressive over several weeks. The destruction of Babylon will be progressive over several weeks, true or false. Number five, what will be the response of the kings and the merchants and the ship captains as they see Babylon uh, burning? Babylon will be set on fire and all burned up. What will be the response of those three groups that are watching? The kings, the merchants, and the, the ship captains and sailors. What will their response be? And you might also put, what will their response not be? Because that is significant also. And then the bonus question, there is a word that begins with the letter D. D as in dog. Uh, the, this word keeps coming up over and over, that uh, God hates that this is happening. 
And it's what Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet are known for. What is that word that begins with the letter D that we need to be very careful about? <clears throat> All right, let's see how you did. So John sees an, an angel with great authority to, and who describes Babylon two times with the word. What have you got for that? Did you get it? Yeah, fallen, fallen, fallen. When it's used twice in a row, it's to emphasize that Babylon is so fallen. Number two, the voice from heaven told believers, come out of her. Come out of Babylon. Get out of town. Remember that? Get away from her sins and the influence of her sin, but also judgment was coming. And God wanted to get the believers out of there first. And then number three, the three sins that uh, Babylon was accused of that we could also um, fall into temptation regarding would be pride, materialistic, and then the third one, to think that we can control the future, to think that we can control what's going to happen. Boy, we're learning these days, if never before, we can't control what's going to happen. But always so good to know that God can, and that God is in control, but we can't. And just lay it down, just give it over him, just accept the fact that our good, kind, wise, loving, powerful Heavenly Father is in control, but we are not. Number four, true or false, the destruction of Babylon will be progressive over several weeks. You got this one, didn't you? Because you know that that's false. It's repeatedly in that chapter it said in one day, in one hour, she's fallen. So it will not be progressive. It will be very quickly. And then number five, the response of the kings, which are the world leaders, the merchants, which would be the businessmen, and the ship's captains and sailors, what is their response? Well, we read in chapter 18 that they're weeping and lamenting their fear and terror. They're going to throw dust on their heads as they see everything that meant so much to them burned to the ground and gone forever. But what we don't see is any repentance. No repentance, no turning to God by these three groups. And then the bonus... What's that word that begins with the letter D that we keep seeing over and over and over that we're warned about? And that is the word deception, deceived. Satan is the great deceiver. The false prophet will deceive with many signs and wonders. And we need to be so careful in our days, even, you know, until we get to heaven, we have to be careful about being deceived. And, of course, that comes through only through knowing the God of the Word of God, the God of the Word, and um, knowing what it says, so that we are not deceived, so that we know what the truth is. Well, in Psalm ninety-six, verses eleven through thirteen, the psalmist says, "Let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all it contains. Let the field exult and all that is in it." Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming. So the whole creation, let them rejoice and exult because he is coming. But listen to this part. He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. And that's what we're studying today about Christ coming. Again, this at the end of the tribulation, not to save. He's not coming to save. He is coming to to judge, And we're going to see in chapter 19 as, as heaven just shouts hallelujah um, because of Christ coming, because of righteousness being established forever. So we have been studying uh, all about the tribulation. We, we started in chapter 5 with the lamb that was slain, receiving the scroll from the father. And he started breaking the seals. And you know the sequence now, right? The seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls, and we've studied all that. We've gone through all of that, and I, we've all learned so much. And then we learned in chapter 17 and 18, our last two lessons, how that Babylon was destroyed, both the false religion and the city, the political system of, um, of the Antichrist, that his, his capital city, destroyed and while it was being destroyed he was out with his armies getting ready to attack Jerusalem so he wasn't there remember the Antichrist is a human he uh, will not be there 
when his capital is destroyed, he will be out with his armies getting ready uh, for that final battle, if you will. It's not really a battle of, of Armageddon. And as we read and think of Babylon being destroyed, and as we read today and study today about um, Christ returning, we have to remember that the, the, the unbelievers who will be alive at that time will have had the greatest opportunity to repent of any people who've ever lived. No one else who's ever lived will have had so many opportunities to see the power of God and the patience of God and to hear the gospel they will have had more opportunities than anyone else at that time. And, and in a way, that's good news if we have loved ones who are living through the tribulation to know that they will hear the gospel. What we're going to study today in chapter 19 is heaven rejoicing as history reaches its culmination and as the true king comes to earth to establish his kingdom forever. So today we're going to be studying about worship, we're going to be studying about a wedding. We're going to be studying a warrior and about a war. Those are the topics today in our lesson. So on page 188 or at the beginning of our lesson, it says, so are you ready? Are you ready for the return of Christ? And to be ready means have you accepted him as your savior? Are you clothed in his righteousness and guaranteed eternal salvation because you are clothed in his righteousness? I jotted a few thoughts down as I was studying about this. Again, the return of Christ is in two phases. As believers, we're looking for the rapture, that first phase. And then, of course, today we're studying the second phase, the second coming. But are you ready means do you understand the gospel? Do you know what it is? Do you know what it includes? Do you believe it? The gospel. The gospel teaches that everyone who has ever lived will spend eternity either in heaven or hell. All will spend eternity in either heaven or hell. Everyone. The gospel teaches that all have sinned. Everyone is a sinner. And the gospel teaches that all sin must be punished. Even one single selfish thought disqualifies us from heaven, and that thought must be punished. The gospel teaches that only perfect people get to go to heaven. None of us are perfect. We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God, and so that all of us deserve hell. That's what the gospel teaches. All of us deserve hell. But the gospel also teaches that if we believe that Jesus is who he says he is, he's the son of God, he is God. And if we believe that he did what he says he did, he came, he took our place, he took our sin and bore our punishment, that God poured out his wrath for our sin on Jesus. Remember, I just said all sin has to be punished. All of our sin has been punished. All of it. Sins from the past, present, and that we have not even committed it. They've already been punished. Jesus took our punishment. And if we believe that, and the Bible says if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and we put our trust completely in him alone, that he took our punishment and he is our Savior, then we are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We are declared perfect. Remember, only perfect people go to heaven, and we are declared perfect when we put our faith in the finished work of what Christ did on the cross. So are you ready? Do you understand that? Do you understand the gospel? Can you explain it to others? We have to be ready. It could happen at any time. Well, today we're going to study three groups of heavenly voices. Last time we studied three groups that were lamenting over the fall of Babylon. And this week we're going to study three groups of heavenly voices that are praising God and the King who is coming. So let's read Revelation 19, verses 1 through 4. Revelation 19, 1 through 4. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude. And there's our first group, 
a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous. For he has judged the great harlot who is corrupting the earth with her immorality. And he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. And a second time they said, this same first group, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. Now here's our second group. They're familiar. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne, saying, Amen. Hallelujah. You know, Amen means right on. I agree. That's true. So as they hear this first group, who are probably angels, because other groups are going to be identified. So this first group, is they're probably angels. And we know there's a really lot of them. As they are praising God, the, the 24 elders and the uh, four living creatures join in. Amen. I agree. Hallelujah. And as we've said before, I believe the 24 elders represent the church. And we will be there, and we'll be part of that group. So, number one in our notes and our timeline, we are right at the very end of the tribulation. Christ hasn't returned yet, but, we're in, our, but in our study, the fall of Babylon takes place in conjunction with the uh, seventh bowl, and so we're right at the very end of the tribulation, right before the return of Christ. And number two in your notes, Revelation 18, 20, the command was given to rejoice over the fall of Babylon, O heaven, rejoice. And so chapter 19 is the response. This is the rejoicing. We just read about that in those first few verses. Um, they're rejoicing over the fact that wickedness will be no more and that Christ will return. And John does hear a loud voice. And it's a great multitude. And as I said, these are probably angels, and, and they are worshiping. And something that's very interesting is they use the word hallelujah. Now, we're used to seeing the word hallelujah in Scripture. But what I didn't realize until I was studying this chapter, this is the only time in chapter 19 here, the only time in the whole New Testament that hallelujah is used. It's not used anywhere else in the New Testament. It's used a lot in the Old Testament. But chapter 19, it's used four times, and only there. Hallelujah. Well, do you know what hallelujah means? A lot of you do. Some of you may have looked it up. In Greek, it's alleluia. In Hebrew, it's uh, hallel yah. Hallel means praise, and yah is the shortened version of Yahweh. So hallelujah means praise God. Hallelujah, praise God. And there are many psalms that have hallelujah in them, especially towards the end of the New Testament. I mean, I'm sorry, the end of psalms. There are a lot of um, psalms that really focus on praise the Lord, praise the Lord. So God is being praised here for his salvation, his glory, and his power. And we're going to come back to this idea of praising God specifically, not just saying, I thank you, God, or I just want to praise you, God, but praising him specifically. And here are some things he's praised specifically for salvation. And this doesn't only mean our justification when we come to Christ, but our ultimate salvation, which is about to happen here in chapter 19 when he returns and sets up his kingdom. So they're praising him for that, the ultimate salvation. And, of course, that he has all glory and power. And then they go on in, um, in verse 2, question number 6 in your notes, why they're praising him for that. We have to keep coming back to this and not forget that his judgments are true and righteous. That means they're valid. That means that the punishment that the harlot, the city of Babylon, got was precisely what she deserved, true and righteous. And then... Uh, they're praising him because he judged the great harlot. He did not allow evil to continue, and that he avenged the blood of the bond servants. Uh, the, the symbolic Babylon, the system of Babylon from the Genesis right up until now, the, the world system that uh, is symbolized by Babylon has been responsible for the death 
of many, many thousands, millions of believers. And we've been studying about that in our Voice of the Martyrs, and it will continue through the tribulation until Babylon is destroyed once and for all. So under number six, it says in your notes, we do not rejoice at the greatness of Babylon's fall. We rejoice that God is true and righteous. Let's look at number eight. We talked about this as we read through the scripture, that the 24 elders and the four living creatures join in this worship. Again, the 24 elders represent the church, which has been raptured and is in heaven all through the tribulation. And the four living creatures are the cherubim who surround the throne and who worship their, their job. They were created to worship and to serve God in whatever way it is that uh, he desires to be worshipped and what, do whatever he desires them to do. So this is the last time that John is going to see this heavenly court with the, the angels. The last time he mentioned the 24 elders and the four living creatures was when there was worship in heaven and then the 144,000 Jews joined in from earth. That was the last time, um, back in chapter 14, that we um, visited them, peeked in on them, and now this is going to be the final time that uh, we get a glimpse of them. But like I said, we are included in that. We will be there for that, I truly believe. Let's go on and read verses 5 through 10 in our Bibles. Revelation 19, 5 through 10. And a voice came from the throne, saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bondservants. Here's our third group. You who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, and like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder. That was a really loud sound, right? All, everyone joining in, hallelujah. Remember, praise God, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Now that is the end of their words that this great multitude is saying. But then we learn some more things that John records for us here in verse 8. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, and this he would be the voice from verse 5, this voice coming from the throne. He said to me, write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are true words of God. I love that, don't you? This is truth. This is absolute truth. We never know from day to day in our, our news and what's going on. Is that the truth? What's true? We know what's true. God's word is true. These are the true words of God. Then I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So we know this is not God, who is this voice from the throne. So it's, it's, it's a, probably another angel, uh, because John falls down to worship him, and he says, do not worship me, I'm just another servant. So this voice from the throne would have been maybe even one of the cherubim that is talking to John. So here we have our three groups now who are worshiping in heaven. This third group is bond servants, those who fear him, the small and the great. So this would be all the redeemed who are in heaven. So remember at this time, there's still an earth, there's still some believers on the earth who have survived the tribulation. There's all the unsaved still on the earth. This is going on in heaven. And so the angels, the church, all the redeemed in heaven, they are all praising together. They're, and the sound, you have a quote there under number 10. It sounds like Niagara Falls and a Texas thunderstorm. Put that together. And that gives us an idea of what this what sounded like to John. And again, they say, hallelujah, praise God. And they praised God because of his righteous judgment, and now they're praising him because he reigns. Now, this is anticipation of his reigning. He's not on the earth yet. He has not set up his kingdom yet. 
But everybody's getting excited about it because they know that it has been prophesied and promised and therefore it is going to happen. And everyone's just getting all excited about the fact that it's close and that it is coming. Oh, I have here in my notes, Psalm 146 through Psalm 150, those psalms in particular, use the word hallelujah a lot. So that might be something you want to read soon, not right now, but read uh, with that word hallelujah in it a lot. Number 13, they are rejoicing, they say, because the marriage of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. So we've got a marriage, a wedding, and a bride. So we go from our worship segment, in some degree, into this wedding. And you see in your notes in number 14 that uh, not only will, if you're a believer in Christ, not only will you be at the wedding, you will be the bride. What do you think about that? You will be the bride. The church is the bride of Christ. So the lamb is Jesus, the lamb that was slain. Jesus and the bride is the church. The church would be everyone who came to Christ in the first century, starting with the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Everyone who came to Christ and believed in Jesus Christ as their Savior from that point in the first century uh, up until the rapture. Once the rapture occurs, the church age is over. And so all of those people from the first century through the rapture who come to Christ, that's called the Bride of Christ. That's the church, the Bride of Christ, and there's going to be um, a wedding. Uh, now, this is symbolic. We're not actually going to have millions and millions of people come down an aisle, you know, to, but it, it, it's, it's used, this language is used figuratively and symbolically because it's the closest, um, most intimate relationship we can have is to be married to someone. And so, that the idea is of just that closeness and love and fellowship of, of um, the church and Jesus Christ. Let's go on and keep talking about wet, the weddings. Um, in our days, the bride usually gets all of the attention and all of the focus, and the groom's just kind of there because he needs to be. Uh, but in this wedding, the, the wedding of the lamb to his bride of the bride, uh, the, the bridegroom, the lamb, gets all the glory. Give all glory to him, it says in verse 7. So now let's talk about historical ancient Jewish weddings and why God might have used the symbolism of a wedding to describe the relationship and what goes on between his bride, the bride of Christ, um, and how, how that relates to a Jewish uh, historical wedding. So number 16 in your notes there, there would be the betrothal, the, um, the engagement period. And um, back in those days, this um, engagement period would be arranged by parents who would make up a marriage contract. And it would be legal and binding, could only be broken by a divorce. And a lot of times the children would be very young when this contract was signed and there would be years and years then of preparation for the actual wedding, but it was very binding and legal, and, and um, the parents would arrange that, that, that betrothal. So uh, letter A there in, uh, in number 16, for the church, the betrothal, that engagement period, when was that contract signed? Well, it was signed in eternity past, when our names were written in the book of life, is when we became engaged uh, to Christ, when we were betrothed. And that's the period we're in right now. We're in the betrothal period. We're not, we don't, haven't had that wedding yet or the presentation, but we are engaged to Christ. And presentation is the second point there. And the presentation uh, in Jewish, back in ancient days, would have been a time of, of partying, of festivities, uh, joy and excitement before the actual ceremony, leading up to the ceremony, the presentation, um, that he hears that a wedding's going to take place and and here's the bride. Well, when will our presentation be? That will be at the rapture. So for the church, the presentation will be at the rapture when Christ takes his bride to his father's house, takes the church off the earth, up into heaven, and presents the bride to his father. And when will that happen? We don't know, but it could be at any time. 
it's imminent. There's nothing else that has to happen before the rapture. So that will be the presentation. And then, uh, again, for the Jews, there would be a wedding ceremony, and the vows would have been exchanged. So we, we just studied here about the marriage of the Lamb, and that's the ceremony for us, the Bride of Christ. And we see here that it's at the end of the tribulation. And it looks like here it's before the second coming, because they're praising, and the marriage of the Lamb has come. So before the second coming... Uh, is the marriage of the Lamb. And again, it's not going to be a big, huge marriage ceremony. It, it's symbolic language here. And then after the actual exchange of vows for the um, ancient Jews, there would be the wedding feast. And this could go on for a long time. Um, and they would just have a lot of uh, festivities and joy and rejoicing. So for us, the marriage feast is called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. And we're not sure exactly when that will occur. Uh, obviously, after the, the wedding to the Lamb, it could be just before the Second Coming. A lot of uh, scholars believe it will happen at the start of the Millennial Kingdom. At the very start of the Millennial, that thousand-year reign, will be the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Um, and again, that Marriage Supper will last then through all the Millennium. So a lot of, of feasting and, and rejoicing um, as... The Church of Christ, the Bride of Christ, rejoices in her union with Christ, and she is with him for all eternity. And then, of course, the consummation takes place after all the wedding ceremonies and the wedding feast. And for us, that will be all of eternity. And all of eternity will be after the thousand-year reign. And then it goes into the eternal kingdom, and we'll be studying about all of this. But in the eternal kingdom, on the new heaven and new earth, um, all of all believers, so not just the bride of Christ, but the tribulation saints and the Old Testament saints and uh, all those from Israel who come to know Christ, they will all be considered the bride. And we'll see that New Jerusalem is called the bride. So we'll, uh, we'll all be part of the bride and, and, um, for all eternity. So this bride concept will be expanded to include everyone who came to Christ. So um, we see throughout biblical history that God has different ways of working with people and different programs for different groups. Um, for instance, there were those who came, uh, the saints, those that believed God and are in heaven now, that uh, before Abraham. You know, Abraham was the start of the Jewish nation, but there were people before Abraham. We look at perhaps Adam and Eve and, and Enoch and and uh, before Abraham, so those, some of those people are in heaven. And then the saints in Israel before Christ, before Christ came, those in Israel who believed God and trusted God, that's another group. And there were Gentiles during that time that believed God and trusted God. And then there, we've studied the, the saints during the tribulation, uh, those that are martyred and, and whose souls are in heaven, and those who live through and survive the tribulation course there's the church age saints so all different groups and God has a little bit different way of working with each group but the bottom line is everyone uh, is in heaven because of the finished work of Christ on the cross that doesn't change for anyone they are there because of the saving work of Christ and that they trusted God and for those after Christ they trusted in his finished work on the cross so let's talk a little bit more here about this bride in number 17. She's wearing fine linen, bright and clean. Of course, that fine linen and, and clean represents purity and holiness and without sin. These clothes stand for, the Bible tells us, the righteous acts of the saints. Now, right, ne right now, those of us who are believers, we have been clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We are considered perfect. We are wearing his righteousness. We call this an imputed righteousness. It's, we're covered in it. It's been imputed to us, credited to us, but we're not really righteous yet. We still sin, but we're covered in the righteousness of Christ. But when we get to heaven... We will be without sin. We will not be able to sin. And we will have an intrinsic righteousness that is given to us. We will truly be holy, not able to sin. And it says here in our passage that she clothes herself, the bride did clothe herself, 
But even these clothes that she clothed herself with were given to her. So wrapped up in this, and it's somewhat of a mystery, but it's the fact that while salvation is totally um, through grace and by faith, and, and that faith comes from God, um, as believers, we are still responsible to live in obedience and to walk with the Lord and to become more and more holy. But even the ability to do that is given by God. But once we are in heaven, we will be without sin and not able to sin. Let's go on to number 18. Blessings given by God in verse 9. Um, there are seven blessings in the book of Revelation. This is the fourth one. And uh, once again, this angel talks right to John. John's watching all this unfold, and this angel talks to John and says, that uh, blessed are those um, who are invited to the marriage supper. So who are those people who are invited to the marriage supper? So we have a wedding going on, and of course, a bride does not get an invitation to her own wedding. You know, can you come that day? We'd love to have you. She does not get an invitation like that. So the announcement is made, blessed are those who will get an invitation. And, and who are those people who will be attending and watching this wedding? Well, most Bible scholars believe that these are the Old Testament saints and the tribulation saints, especially if this marriage feast uh, takes place at the beginning of the millennium. So remember, we've got the tribulation and then the return of Christ, and then he sets up his millennial kingdom for a thousand years. And at the very beginning of that thousand years, if that's when the marriage supper is, who will be attending that? Because the millennium starts out with all believers. No, there's no one unsaved there. So we'll have, um, at, at the end of the tribulation, the Old Testament saints get their glorified bodies. So they'll be there in their glorified bodies. And then the tribulation saints will be there to watch, to be at this feast. And they will be in two different forms. If, if it indeed takes place at the beginning of the, of the um, millennium, they will, there will be ones in human bodies that got saved during the tribulation. And there will be those who have their glorified bodies. that They, get, they receive their glorified bodies at the end of the tribulation also. And we will be studying that. So Old Testament saints and tribulation saints are the guests invited to this marriage feast, which... Again, I don't know for sure, but it could be taking place literally on the earth at the beginning of the millennium. Maybe not. It might be in heaven. Some think the wedding is in heaven, the feast on the earth during the millennium. And then, wow, all this, John is hearing all this, seeing all this, and the angel says to him, these are the true words of God. And the angel probably knew that John needed to hear that. Remember where John is. He's exiled on an island, and he's writing to these churches that are small, and having a lot of problems and having uh, discord and disunity and being deceived. And so this angel says to him, all that you've seen and all, that, all these visions, this is true. This is going to happen. And how encouraging that had to have been for John at that time and how encouraging it is for us. And you have a question there for discussion number 20. At the end it says, are you running to truth? We have all we need in God's word. And as we go through this, this time uh, in our country right now with COVID-19 and all the unknowns and, and uh, um, every day we're hearing something different and things seem to get worse and seem to be chaotic and out of control, we have to run to truth or we're going to fall apart. We have to turn to the truth of God's word. And I love how so many of you are encouraging one another and sharing the truth of God's word with one another to really help one another with that. I want us to take our, I forgot to have you get this out, I'm sorry, if you have it handy, your bright yellow sheet that says Worship of the Worthy One, where we have been recording all the worship we see in heaven. In chapter 19, this wraps up the end of the worship in heaven, and I want to fill that in. So if you have that handy, go ahead and get that out. And so for 19, 1 through 3, we have this great multitude. And we said these are probably angels. So 19, 1 through 3, probably all the angels. Remember, too many to count. Millions and millions of angels. Okay. 
and they are praising the Father. They're worshiping the Father. And then 19.4, that was that second group, the 24 elders and the four living creatures. They are worshiping the Father, and they're praising him, shouting hallelujah. And then the last one, as we finish our sheet, 19.6 through 8, it's all of them together, the great multitude and all of the redeemed in heaven, all the inhabitants in heaven there are also praising the Father for his righteous acts and for his judgment and that he reigns. So you can get that all written down. And then as we said before, looking at question 22, that um, John is so overcome by this and he falls down to worship and he's this angel and the angel says don't do that. Uh, worship God. And John's going to do this again later on in the book of Revelation. He's going to fall down before an angel again. And we might think, John, what are you doing here? We don't worship angels. We only worship God. And yet, who knows how we would act if an angel appeared before us in, in all of its glory and brightness and uh, boy, we don't know how we would act, but uh, twice John's going to uh, just fall down in front of an angel. Only God is to be worshipped. And th we learn a little bit about angels here. In question 25, the angel says, don't worship me. I'm just a fellow servant like you and the other believers are. So we don't worship angels. We don't pray to angels. We don't ask angels for things. We pray to God. We trust God. We worship God. And God can send angels to answer prayers, and he does that sometimes, but they are just fellow servants, and as this angel himself says. And in number 26, the angel talks about, let me just read that verse here. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And it's easy to read that and just, oh, okay, good, and just keep going. I don't really know what that means and keep going. But what that angel is saying is that the whole Bible is about Jesus. The angel is saying the prophecies from the Old Testament and all through the Testament, they all point to Jesus. We see Jesus in every book of the Bible, and that is so exciting. And many, many different lists have been made as far as how does Jesus appear in, in different books and in different passages all throughout Scripture. So there's many different lists, but... I provided one for you. Uh, your small group leader would have sent out. If, if she hasn't had a chance to do that, she will soon. Uh, but this handout, uh, for the testimony of Jesus, is the spirit of prophecy. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. I just want you to, to know that you have that and that it takes every book in the Bible and shows uh, how Christ is portrayed or we see Christ or a glimpse of Christ or a foreshadowing of Christ in each book. And you can... Look through that and, and be blessed by that. But I, I do want us to notice the revelation, the very last one. Revelation, he is the king of kings and the lord of lords, the alpha and the omega, the beginning of the end. But isn't that so um, encouraging to know the whole Bible, as this angel says, is about Jesus. The whole Bible points to Jesus. I want to pause here before we get into the return of Christ in our passage here. I want to pause and just talk about worship for a couple minutes because we've been studying all these groups worshiping and all through the book of Revelation we've been studying about worship. And so let's just, I want to give you five points and these are from a message I listened to by Mike Fabaris. What we learn about worship, in particular here in these first ten verses. What we learn about worship because we were created to worship and we all worship and we're commanded to worship and God is pleased when we worship. And so what does that look like? Well, here are some things we can learn just from this passage here. And we see in this passage that worship is loud. <laughs> Have you noticed that? That every time it talks about worship, loud and multitudes and it sounds like rushing water and, and it's loud. There is not a sign in the lobby of heaven that says, shh, we're worshiping, quiet, we're trying to worship. Now, I know in our own churches, especially, I know as, as I'm getting older, loud things bother me and loud noises are difficult. But I know in my glorified, when I get to heaven and I have a different type of, 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 of uh, 
ability, um, that loud is not going to bother me. It's, we're we're going to rejoice in that. So worship is loud. It's enthusiastic, and everyone is involved. I don't think in heaven there's people kind of shuffling their feet, standing over to the side, side saying, you know, I don't like that song. I don't like that song. Or I don't like that beat, or I don't like that tempo, or yeah, th this isn't doing anything for me. We're not going to see that in heaven. It is loud. It's enthusiastic. Everyone is involved in worship. And we will do that in heaven, but we're to do that now, too. Be enthusiastic and involved. And then secondly, we see that worship is authentic. What do I mean by that, that worship is authentic? Well, the people that we're seeing worship here, they know what they're saying. They know what it means. They believe what they're saying. For instance, when they say, hallelujah, they know what that means. It means praise God, and they answer by saying, amen, I agree. When we worship, do we think about what we're singing or saying? Do we even know what it means? And I know there's some songs maybe that were written long ago that it's difficult. What does this mean? But when we worship, we need to understand and know and agree with what we're saying and singing. And God is pleased by that. It's authentic. Thirdly, I mentioned this before, their worship is specific. They don't just say God is great. Or they don't just say we praise God. And it's okay to do that at times, of course. But they give specifics as to why. We see this all through the Psalms, and we see this here. We see it in the prayers in the New Testament of the different apostles and prophets. But uh, they praise God for his character. They praise him for what he does. They praise him for his attributes. Um, a good example of that is, well, there's many good examples. It's Psalm 103 says, I'm going to thank thanking Lord. And this, this is what I'm so thankful for. And this is what the Lord has done. So it's specific worship. Probably all of us could get better at that. And then number four, this worship as we see is full of joy. It's positive. These people are so happy and rejoicing to be able to worship God. Do we prepare our hearts for worship? And I'm not just talking about, you know, in a worship service on a weekend, that little time of worship, all of that's a big part of it. And we sh should make sure we're getting together with other believers to worship. But are, are we full of joy when we worship? And is it positive? And are we so thankful for the opportunity to get to worship God? Or we just can't wait till it's over or on to other things? And then very important, the fifth point here is that worship is exclusive. Exclusive meaning we are to only worship God. And we know that. And we say, oh yeah, 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 I, I do that. I only worship God. But of course, the truth of the matter is we all worship all day long. We worship something. And our behavior and our responses and how we spend our time and how we react to things reveal what it is we're worshiping. What means the most to us? Where are our priorities? Is it God? We're to worship only God, not to worship people or angels or, or any person that's ever lived or Mary or anything. We are to worship only God. And we learn so much just from observing this worship that is going on in heaven. Well, the Bible teaches us, as we've been studying, that after the tribulation, things are going to get so, so much better. We can't even imagine what they will be like. But before that, things were going to get unimaginably worse. Because there's only one solution for our world's problems, and that's the return of the true king. The return of Jesus Christ to establish his kingdom. And during the tribulation, things will get much worse, and there will be much more demonic activity. There will be a time of escalation and human wickedness. And despite all the judgment being poured out on the earth, things will get worse and worse. And then at the end of the tribulation, Christ will return. Now, we need to um, remind ourselves that the, the second coming at the end of the tribulation is totally different from the rapture. The descriptions in the Bible are totally different. So in, in uh, the second coming, um, Christ comes with his saints. And we're going to see that in just a minute. He comes at the second come with his saints, but at the rapture, he comes to get them. So at the rapture, he comes to get his saints, we'll go up to heaven. And at the second coming, we are coming back down with him. 
And at the rapture, Christ will meet us in the air. We will rise up and meet him in the air. But the second coming, we will come back with Christ from heaven, and we will come all the way down to the earth. There is no judgment described at all in conjunction with the conjuncture with the rapture. There's no judgment. But as we're going to see here with the second coming, there is a lot of judgment. Christ, in fact, that is why Christ is returning. One reason is to judge the earth. So we're going to see here that John, this is going to be the third time that John sees the vision of Jesus Christ since we started the book of Revelation. The first time was Christ, the description of Christ uh, walking among the lampstands on the earth. The second time was when John had the vision of Jesus as the slain lamb, the lamb who was slain. And now here's his third vision of Jesus, Christ as the conquering king, as the mighty warrior the victorious Lord of all the ages. So let's look at verses 11 through 13. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. So that's what he's going to do when he comes back. It's all righteous, perfect, but he's going to judge and wage war. Verse 12, his eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. He has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. All right, so this is the best vision yet that John will have had of Christ in, in these three visions he's had of Jesus in this book. Christ is coming on a white horse. The significance of this, and I'm sure you got this, was that a white stands for purity and holiness, and that a white horse is what kings and victors would ride uh, when they were, uh, when they had conquered. They would they would ride down in like a parade on a white horse. Now remember the first time when Christ came, and you weren't there, <laughs> but he came on a donkey as he rode through the streets. This was a foreshadowing of when he would return and ride that white horse. And Christ is called faithful and true. Don't you love that? The quote at the um, right under letter B there, I think, helps us understand how significant that is. The description of Jesus as faithful and true is in marked contrast with the unfaithfulness and the lies of Satan, Antichrist, evil empire, and wicked people. The very fact that he's coming again as he promised confirms that he is faithful and true. And so John sees the heavens open. He'd seen that before in chapter 4 when he was called up in a vision, but he sees the heavens open. The time has come that all of history has been waiting for. This is the culmination of redemptive history that John sees. And Christ comes on this white horse to judge and wage war. And we already talked about the fact the first time he came, he came to save. He came to suffer. He came to serve. But now he's coming to judge and wage war. And his eyes are described as flames of fire, meaning he sees all. But also fire is usually symbolic of judgment. He's coming to judge. He knows everything. He has all power, and he will judge in righteousness. Remember how he's described in his first coming. He was described with eyes full of compassion. He came with forgiveness. At times he was sorrowful. He was at times very tender, his first coming. But see the contrast here? His second coming, his eyes are full of fire. He's coming to judge and wage war. And he's symbolically wearing many crowns. Again, this is symbolic language. He's not going to have all these crowns all over his head. So this is symbolic. Remember, symbolism is used in Revelation for us to learn things we wouldn't know unless the symbolism was used. So what is symbolic of the many crowns? Uh, well, it was um, an ancient custom that whoever you conquered, you took the crown of the king of that country or that nation. You took his crown, and you had this collection of crowns then because you conquered. So the first century believers who read these letters would have understand. He, he's got many crowns because he has conquered all. He has all the crowns. This word crown here is diadem, which means ruler and king over all. There's different words for crown. This is ruler. 
and it says that there's a name written on him that no one knows except himself. So what do you think that name is that no one knows except himself? Well, it's futile to speculate <laughs> because we're not going to know it. And that's just a reminder there are many, many things about God that um, we don't know now. Uh, there's many things that we will know as eternity unfolds, but because God is unlimited, uh, we'll spend all of eternity, eternity getting to know God better. Um, but we'll never fully know him. And then he's wearing a robe dipped in blood. Now this blood is not symbolic of the cross and the crucifixion. And again, when he comes, he won't be wearing a bloody robe. But again, this is symbolism of what's going to happen, that he is coming to conquer. He is coming to vanquish the nations. We studied about the blood flowing for 200 miles as high as the horse's bridle. So this is in anticipation of what is going to happen. He is going to destroy his enemies. So it's not his own blood. It's the, the symbolic of the blood of his enemies that he is going to conquer. And then a name we are given to know is he, his name is the Word of God. He's called that often, the Word of God. In the book of John, he is the Word of God. He is God, and everything he says comes from God the Father. He, he is the Word of God. But coming as judge. When he came the first time, he had a crown of thorns that was pressed into his head as the blood dripped down his face, that blood for us. But when he comes again the second time, no crown of thorns. He's going to have all the crowns of all the nations, and he will be the king of kings over all. All right, 14 through 16 are our next verses to read. So he is coming on a white horse, verse 14, and the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We cannot begin to imagine, and I can in no way do... Um, present this lesson or this information or this truth in a way that we can really realize how awesome and fantastic this is going to be. But we're getting just a little glimpse of it here, that King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So he is coming back with an army, these armies from heaven, clothed in linen and white and clean, and they're on white horses also. And who is this? Well, if you looked up Revelation 17, 14, this is those who are the called, the chosen, and the faithful. That's the church. That's the bride of Christ. That's us. We will return with him in our linen, clean and bright, because we've had the wedding, dressed in the, the white, clean, bright linen, and we're returning with him um, to the earth um, at the second coming. And then also the holy angels. And we read about that in Matthew, that he will return with his angels, and they are described sometimes in scripture as wearing linen, bright and clean and, and white and shining. And so we know for sure that this army that returns with them on horses uh, are made up of the, the church and the angels. Now, some believe that also will be um, the tribulation saints and uh, everyone else in heaven. But for sure, these verses tell us um, that the, the Church of Christ and the angels will be coming. And a question, we see that uh, Christ will be wearing a robe dipped in blood. Is there any mention of blood on our clothing? No. We're not actually going to fight. We're not going to need to fight, are we? In fact, there's not going to be a fight. Christ is going to speak, and all his enemies will be destroyed. And we're not carrying any weapons, because Jesus will be the only conqueror here. And number 30, will there be an actual sword coming out of his mouth? And we said before from the first vision, no, he's not going to come back with this sword sticking out of his mouth. This is symbolic of the power of his words. He is going to speak the word, 
and all his enemies will be destroyed. He will kill all his enemies. So he's going to kill, who does that include? That those armies that are all, will all be gathered to fight. He's, he will uh, speak and they will all be destroyed. And then from all over the world, it's called the judging of the nations, the sheep and goat uh, judging from all over the earth at that time. Uh, all unbelievers will also be killed at that time. And the unbelievers will all go to hell. And remember, hell at this time, also called Hades, is a temporary holding place. So all unbelievers, when they die, now, or even during the tribulation, or at this battle, all unbelievers go to hell or Hades, the temporary hell. And then we will see later on, after the thousand-year millennium, they get transferred from the temporary hell um, into the lake of fire, but we'll talk more about that when we get to that when we get to that week. So he will destroy all the armies and he will destroy uh, all the unbelievers and all the humans, almost all the humans will go to uh, hell. I like the quote there by Skip Heidzig. For the first time Jesus came to earth, he did so to deal with the sin issue. When he comes back, it will be to deal with the sovereignty issue. Well, um, number 33 from Daniel 2, verses 44 and 45. And I just want to read that to tie this in. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and he couldn't remember what it was, and he wanted to know what it was and the meaning of it, and God gave Daniel uh, the information, and Daniel went to the king and said, here's what it means. And then at, uh, in verse 44, Daniel 2. In the, day, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. That's this one we're talking about, that, uh, that thousand-year reign which goes right into the eternal kingdom. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Insomuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it was crushed, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. So I want to show you a picture we've been studying about, a little bit about Daniel's dream. You see that first picture there on the left. Uh, uh, Daniel uh, was given the dream by God, and can you all see that, hopefully? Um, the statue represents the different empires, and in this dream starts with the uh, Babylonian, and uh, with the head of gold, and then the Medo-Persian, and then the Greek, and then the Roman, and then the toes represent the uh, Antichrist kingdom. And then in the picture, um, on the other side there, you see a stone that comes and crushes the whole thing. And that's what this passage in Daniel is talking about. That stone represents God's eternal kingdom, final kingdom, which will destroy all earthly kingdoms and set up for all eternity the kingdom of God. And that's the prophecy from Daniel that we are studying right here in this passage today that's going to happen. All right, let's uh, 17 through 21. As we finish up our chapter, then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice. They like to speak loudly, don't they? He cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds, now this is interesting, this time the angel's talking to the birds, which fly in mid-heaven, come and assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of commanders, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, and small and great. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. So here we are. It's in Israel, uh, near um, Ar Armageddon, we call this, in that valley of Har Armageddon. And uh, Christ is coming from heaven on his white horse with all his armies and on the earth are all the armies of the earth gathered together. So John is seeing this vision. And then just like that, let's go into 20, verse 20, the beast was seized. Remember, that's the Antichrist. And with him, the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived, there's that word, he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two, remember these are humans, the 
the Antichrist and the false prophet, these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. So Jesus speaks the word, all the rest of the army is killed, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. And so this angel is standing there. Looks like he's, it says, in the middle of the sun. He's kind of blocking the sun, and he calls out to all the birds to come and feast. There's going to be a feast, number 36 in your notes. We can be glad we're not invited to this feast. You may have had dinners or gatherings where you weren't invited. Maybe you were kind of sad you weren't invited. This is one we don't want to be invited to because the menu is the flesh of kings, commanders, mighty men, horses. All men are, invite, uh, are going to be on the menu. And Skip Heidzik says, take your pick. Attend the supper. And this could be um, the supper of the lamb or... Um, or you can be the supper. So we can attend the supper by coming with Christ and watching this go on and just attend it. Or we can be the supper. So we've got the supper of the Lamb and we've got the supper of God. Two totally different suppers. So this is the final battle. This is Armageddon. And as we read that the armies of the earth and the beast and, and, and the false prophet are aligned, they, they, they foolishly come thinking they can fight against God. But immediately, the beast and the false prophet will be thrown alive into the lake of fire. Now, these will be the first occupants of the lake of fire. And obviously, a human body would not last long in the lake of fire. And they are going to be there for all eternity. So they will be given bodies that can survive for all eternity being in the lake of fire. This is the first mention of the lake of fire. And first mention of it, and these are the first occupants of the lake of fire. They're going to be joined later by all the occupants of hell, will be sentenced to their different levels of punishment, and be thrown into the lake of fire. All the armies will be killed, as I mentioned, and all the unbelievers will also be killed, but they will go to hell um, the temporary holding place until after the millennium. And yes, the birds do get their supper. What's interesting, um, I found out that every year, millions of birds migrate uh, south from Europe, and they fly right over Israel on, their, on this migration. And, and uh, the Israelis study this migration of the birds because it interferes with their airplanes. And so it, it's just interesting that Here's all these birds coming for the supper, and Israel is known for having all these birds fly over in, on their migration, during their, their migration here. So as we see, this battle turns out not to be a slaughter for the beast, but a supper for the birds. So here's a street poll. This is something to think about. If you did a street poll, if you went up to different people and said... Do you think you deserve to be slaughtered while birds eat your flesh? Be slaughtered and have birds eat you. Do you think you deserve that? Most people would say no. And then if you were to ask him, well, well then, do you think you are absolutely perfect? Again, most people would say, well, well, no. But see, they don't get the connection unless we are. Indeed, absolutely perfect. We do deserve to be slaughtered and eaten by the birds. We don't even get that connection all the time, that we all deserve hell. So as we study this, one of my prayers is that we learn to love Christ more and value more his sacrifice and his grace to us and his love for us. And also as we study this, as I started out by saying, Jesus may not be what people expect as he comes and he judges and he destroys and the birds eat the flesh of people. And therefore, we need to present Christ in a balanced way as we tell others about Christ. Yes, he is loving and good and wise and he died for us. But he's, and he is our savior, but he is coming back to judge. And people need to be ready. People need to be ready. Well, let's just go over number 41, the different stages of the campaign of Armageddon. 
we'll finish up quickly with that and you can get on with uh, the rest of your day the eight stages and uh, Donna was just showing me that she found a website that has all this on it uh, if you were to, to Google the eight stages of Armageddon and it's by a group called Compass. Don't do that right now, but that will give you a lot of this information. So quickly going over these stages, and this is by pulling all different scriptures together. So stage one is the uh, the armies of Antichrist gather for the final destruction. Remember in the sixth bowl, the Euphrates River is dried up so they can cross over and they're marching towards Jerusalem uh, for this big battle. That's stage one. Stage two is that... Uh, the city of Babylon is destroyed, and that's the seventh bowl. Stage three is fighting in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem will be attacked and ravaged and um, will fall. And stage four is then the armies of the Antichrist move against the hidden Jews, those that fled and are hidden. And because of the, the, um, the fighting in Jerusalem and the armies are on their way to uh, those Jews who are hidden in the wilderness, at this point, this is when the Jews will cry out to Jesus and confess their sin and confess that they rejected him as their Messiah, and they will all cry out for help in desperation, and they will plead for him to return and to help them. And then right after that is the next stage, which is when Christ does return. See, he, he, Christ said that the Jews would come back to him, that they would be saved, and they would acknowledge him as their Messiah, and that's when they do that. And then he returns, and as we just studied, there's that battle, not a battle really, uh, but Christ destroys uh, all the armies, and then he, he stands in victory on the Mount of Olives. I have a couple pictures here. I don't know if you can see them too well, but this first one, is a picture of Jerusalem as it is now. If you were standing on the Mount of Olives looking at old Jerusalem, you see the, um, can you see that? Mm -hmm. You can see that gold dome, um, the Dome of the Rock, which is a, a Muslim shrine, a Muslim um, place of worship. Now, during the tribulation, that won't be there. I don't know if those walls will be there. I don't know how much will be there. But this is the area of Jerusalem um, where there'll be the fighting, uh, and this is the Mount of Olives. And then, so at the end of the, that whole campaign and fighting, when Christ comes back, he will stand on the Mount of Olives. He will return on the Mount of Olives. So this picture is taken looking at the Mount of Olives. Let me get this to, Okay, this is uh, standing at the wall of Jerusalem, looking back at the Mount of Olives. You can see it is covered with churches, it's also covered with olive trees. That's why it's called the Mount. This is where Christ will return after all these other stages. He will return there, and the mountain will split. Um, but he will return there in victory to the earth after these other things take place. Well, we've talked about a lot. We've learned a lot today. I want to close by reading Titus chapter 2. And as I read this, remember, as believers, let's, let's relate this to the rapture. Those who are saved during the tribulation will take this same passage and relate it to the second coming. Uh, but listen as I read this. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Here it is looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. So let's be looking for that blessed hope, that glorious appearing, which could happen at any time. I'm going to pray as we close, but remember... Hopefully we'll be here next week, either here in my office or there in heaven already or in the air on our way up. Here, there, in the air. Anyway, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time in your word. Thank you that you will return. Thank you that you are in control. Thank you for the cross for our salvation. And Lord, I do pray that we would take this information and love you more and tell others about Christ. We give you the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.